Make your way to the podium. Yes, I'm Burt Jones. I've lived for 15 years on Pompano Canal, and I'm here today to give the City Council a little lesson in hydrodynamics and civic responsibility. We're all concerned about the seawall erosion cases. Now, if you're not familiar with what Pompano Canal is, it's the large one that comes in from the harbor with the sets of Coast Guard approved navigation markers. A lot of people know it as the Yacht Club Canal because you come in, turn left, and go to the Yacht Club. Uh, that canal, according to what I've been able to determine from a survey, an informal one, using Google Maps, the satellite view, and the city tax record, has suffered 22% of seawall failure as a result of Hurricane Irma. There are $250,000 of annual taxes collected from the homes along that seawall annually. We are almost pushing $300,000 of tax revenue. There are several cases where the seawall slippage is so bad, the land has eroded to within 15 feet of either the pool walls or the house foundation. So there's the situation we have. Now, what's the problem? The problem, obviously, is more rapid erosion of this is going to endanger pools and houses and cause further pollution in the canal. Last night, Tuesday night, we had, the canal had 12 large boats, and by large I'm saying over 40 feet in length, come down the canal, turn around and come back out. This is on a Tuesday night, and this is scheduled to go on until December 31st. 12 trips a night, boats 40 feet or large are long making that passageway. These tour boats displace as a minimum 20 tons. Most of them displace considerably more than that, but let's make our math easy and use 20 tons. Now, if you remember Archimedes' principle, a body floats because it displaces its weight in water. So each time a boat comes through, we're displacing 20 tons of water. Where does it go? <coughs> well, it goes up on the sides and it comes back and then the boat turns around and it repeats that. It's not a question of boat speed, although that does contribute, it's a question of water flow. And it's the long as the boat's there, there's gonna be water movement back and forth. Now, if you've got 12 trips a night, which we saw last night, an average night, and you've got 20 tons per boat, you're moving 240 tons of water in this night. All right, let's make that easier to think of because 240 tons is an incomprehensible number. Let's convert this to gallons. That is 600,000 gallons of water moving around on a Tuesday night in this canal. 600,000 gallons. Look at your annual water or your monthly water bill. Most of us are using about eight to 12,000 gallons of water a month in our home. We moved 600,000 gallons just last night. These trips, will, these trips will run till December 31st. So I'd like the city to consider using the police boat to stop any boats larger than 40 feet in the canals until January the 1st. Otherwise, I think the city is liable for a class action lawsuit for home damage that results as a result of foundation damage. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Fritz, Bernstor Isles. I live on the Perimeter Canal on, um, off Macedonia. Um, I notice you're talking about boat speeds in here, and I believe Bernstor Isles uh, is uh, minimum wake. Uh, the problem we have is most boaters don't know what minimum is, and, and it can vary. Uh, I'm a boater in New Jersey for years, and most of the inlets there are no wake. And I really think with the amount of kayakers we have, the amount of canoes we have, we have people who park at their docks, and especially on the perimeter canal, and have boats come by with a one foot, two foot, or sometimes higher wake, it leads to damage, it's gonna cause erosion, it's gonna affect the seawalls. I think all of Burnt Store Isles, or at least the perimeter canals, should be no wake, not minimum wake. And there is a big difference, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Regular agenda item. Make your way to the podium. Anybody else? Okay. Seeing none, we will move into the first item under budget, the progress report on capital improvement projects. Good morning for the record. Joan LeBeau, Urban Design Manager. And I will start off for the capital improvements program presentation. Uh, Harbor Walk West Playground was talked about earlier uh, during the CRA portion of the meeting. 
Um, everything that Mr. Koenig said is uh, true. We are moving to complete this project in February of 2018, barring any problems. Um, and the funding is available at 500,000. The Harbor Walk restrooms we've talked about as well. Um, we are looking, if all goes well, we may begin um, the construction in 2018 at the playground site, we will see. <coughs> and then um, construction to begin in 2019 in the pavilion areas. And the projected budget there is 550. So I just questioned that with Howard during my briefing because obviously that's for two restroom buildings. Mm -hmm. And I believe the first set of plans we had one building exceeded that number was very close to which, that number which was the reason we pulled it out we're hoping with the redesign that the um, numbers will come back much less are they going to give us a new engineer's estimate of cost yes yes they have to yes okay. <laughs> thank you uh, areas 2a and 2b will be presented by Mitchell Austin in the next portion. And um, this is just the update to the next phase of the Harbor Walk West project. Uh, we will be looking at the sh uh, additional street parking, the landscaping, decorative lights. A lot of what we have heard from area one, we will be um, putting into consideration for the redesign in area two as we move forward. Uh, the design, again, is looking to be completed by 2018. Uh, and then the construction, hopefully, to that late 2018. <coughs> the money is available, is, is already um, set for, we've estimated the design budget at 150 and the construction budget at 1.5 million. The Mary Street connection is uh, moving forward as well. It will be the connection from the sidewalk to the Harbor Walk path. Um, improvements hopefully will be beginning in 2018 as well, and the project budget is 45,000. The Lashley project, um, we are anticipating to begin construction of that um, after the season. Uh, they are working on the plans currently. The engineer is um, in touch with Public Works, has um, had made some contact with them, and again, we're looking to begin that after this current um, season. And the budget there um, was approved in, tw uh, in December of uh, 16th at 205000 The Ponce Park redesign um, was presented to you by the engineer at the last one of um, several months ago. Um, <coughs> we have not received any additional updates from him. Uh, we are in contact with him and hoping to have a meeting with him tomorrow at our design studio. Uh, we will advise accordingly if he um, attends. Thank you. Provide updates. The US 41 Mert Bridge, the design is underway. Um, all seems to be going well. We're looking for the design to be completed at the end of um, 2018. And it is through the Sun Trails funding, uh, pro the grant that we received. And we are moving forward on that. Intersection treatments, we will be working with the Public Works Group on doing those um, ADA connections on Goldstein and Showalter Avenue. Um, and uh, again, everything seems to be moving on that as well. The US 41 streetscapes trees. We have actually met with the contractor again. Um, due to the Hurricane Irma, we were all set to go in and, and put the plants in. Hurricane Irma came in, uh, damaged the trees that we had purchased. Um, and then we had issues with the DBI group, um, who is the group that monitors and, and handles the right-of-way areas on US 41. We have met with them. There were some uh, line of sight issues. We will be relocating several trees um, southward between the Akia Sta Road and Airport Road along the path there. Um, we met yesterday, we walked the site. They see no problems with it. We're working with utilities right now to update, um, to find a water source for them. And um, we should have a signed uh, updated contract from them uh, sometime today or tomorrow. And that uh, those funds will be coming from both FPL and the city. 
our planning studies are moving forward. Uh, we've actually had um, our transportation study went out for bid. We uh, received um, only two awards. It had to go out to bid two or three times. We had no respondents the first two times. Uh, we finally do have um, an, an app, uh, contractor who was interested and they will be coming to you for awarding of the bid, I believe at the December 20th meeting. So that's our transportation study, our climate adaptation update. Uh, we were we updated you on the need for an additional 15,000 on that. Uh, we will be coming, we are working on the scope and we will be um, putting that out for bid sometime in early January. ADA transition plan improvements. We have put together a committee. We will be meeting next week to prioritize the list uh, that are needed uh, for the projects in the city. And we do have a projected budget of 300,000 right now. Fresh Market Garden we heard about already as well. It's moving along and it is looking to be completed as well in February 2018. Nature Park Phase 2, if you haven't been out there, please take a, a walk out there and look at the Phase 2 section. We've updated the um, picnic area. The benches will be going in sometime this month. Public Works will be installing those. Um, the, si the concrete pads have been laid. The pa uh, a smaller path has been identified. What you see there will be um, another project we'll be working on for um, next year and we're looking at a budget of 130,000 there. And I believe that is my the end of my presentation. If there's any questions? Questions for Jane? No. Thank you. Good morning, Mark Gehring, Public Works. I'll take over on the Public Works projects. Uh, the drainage improvements, this is, most of this is uh, the Boca Grande area. We have that out for design with a consultant and the design is supposed to be completed in January of 2018. Uh, the consultant was here a few months ago and showed that basically he's adding trunks, uh, drainage lines through the neighborhood, uh, bringing the water down uh, so that it doesn't all uh, get backed up in the ditches waiting to get out. Uh, the railroad ditch is the problem there. Uh, the swale drainage improvements, this is our large drainage project throughout the city. We've completed uh, Burnt Store Meadows, nearing completion in Burnt Store Isles. Uh, the con contractor got a late start and then followed by a very slow progress for several months. Um, he is now up to speed. His production rate now is what we need him to be continuous throughout the year in order to spend the money that we've allocated for this project. We need him though now to speed that up some more to make up for all the ground that he's lost uh, so that we can get our work our way into the Isles and then the rest of Punta Gorda. Um, so we, we're making some progress, but uh, he has the same complaint that all the other contractors do, that they can't get enough workers to, to fulfill what he needs done. Mark, do you have an updated schedule that might be available? I have people calling me about that. Updated schedule. We're still working on last year's schedule um, uh, to come into the aisles with the first round of priorities. Mm -hmm. Are you speaking of when we're coming into the aisles? Well, yeah, a specific schedule of the, the next properties that'll be done when you get into PGI. Uh, well, they're still working through um, BSI right now. I understand so that. So they, don't, don't, they haven't given us anything, we can push them for that. But um, I'd feel more comfortable if we, we make sure that we, we have a good handle on what they're giving us and not just put out some list that okay. is a fallacy that they're not gonna be able to achieve. Sure. Okay. We'll work on that though. Uh, ADA curb improvements, this goes throughout the city. Anytime we pave a street, we have to make sure the adjacent curb ramps and sidewalks are ADA compliant. Um, not a big hit this year, this coming year. Uh, when we did um, Marion Avenue and Olympia though, uh, last year it was a big, big deal. As we put together next year's paving program, the following year's paving program, we may see this bump up next year. It just depends how many uh, non-compliant ramps we have in the paving areas. Uh, sidewalk improvements. The bulk of this $344,000 is the Madrid sidewalk. Um, I'm sorry to, to report that we're way behind schedule on that. Uh, the project keeps growing on us. We initially 
uh, were tasked with putting a sidewalk on the um, south side of Madrid, uh, which turned into a drainage project on the south side of the Madrid, Madrid, and is now a drainage project on the north side of Madrid also in order to get all of that water out of there and accomplish that. We have made some uh, progress. DOT has replaced the pipes under the driveway on 41 going into the shopping center. Um, that we were gonna put in our work program. Uh, the, the pipes were failing, but we also need to get an ADA compliant uh, sidewalk across in front of the, uh, the bank that's the geometric bank building there on the corner. Uh, we're trying to get an ADA compliance there. So DOT came in, replaced that sidewalk, and they've also given us our permit uh, where we have to make a connection from the 7-Eleven out to the burnt store uh, intersection. So we have the permit for that, and as soon as we can free up our concrete contractor, we'll have him start that in, in segments um, so that we can get that going. Uh, then NPDES, this is just an ongoing project where we're required by the federal government to uh, do annual reporting on our stormwater management. Um, the little uh, marker there that's on the inlets, they let us know this year that it's time to replace those. Uh, that's a, a big deal for the feds that we go out and each one of our storm sewers put this little marker on there to pe tell people not to dump things and paint and other chemicals into the storm sewers. Uh, TMDLs, uh, this one, we're gonna hold this one in here again this year. Uh, it's been carrying over funds each year. Uh, several years ago, there was a scare that the feds were going to uh, designate certain water bodies and then we'd have to have certain mitigation projects for this and it was gonna be quite complex. I think, um, well, the, that project has certainly uh, fallen to the wayside with the feds and I think with the current regulatory environment, we'll probably see this thing go away. I, I would like to not see it on our agenda next year. Um, they did declassify two Punta Gorda waters that they said were, um, uh, I forget the biological term, but they had them listed as having nutrient loading impaired, yes. Um, and they declassified those two bodies. So everything's moving in a good direction for that. <coughs> Bridge repair, uh, our bridges for the most part in Punta Gorda are in pretty good shape. We just, the state does uh, biannual inspections for all bridges in the state. They inspect ours and then they give us a work list of things that they need us to do. So we keep a little money around to take care of whatever might come up with the bridges. Capital project management, that is just to fund uh, $90,000 annually that's set aside so that the project managers that work in the engineering group can bill their time to those projects so that it's true cost of what it costs to build that project, including the staff time to oversee it. Additional harbor access, um, some know it is bird cut. Uh, it's going through its permitting. I am told by the, uh, the engineer though that he's having some troubles and he may be coming and asking for a meeting with Mr. Koenig to uh, see where we wanna go through political channels uh, the Army Corps apparently has bounced us. Uh, uh, Hans was here a few weeks ago and, and told us some, uh, unless we get a new reviewer or so, I guess it's even worse than that, they bounced us in the system. So he's, he's gonna come in and request a meeting with Howard and see where we wanna go with that, what legislator we might wanna uh, approach with that. We've done it before. Um, soil stabilization for the library, that came up this morning. Uh, the, we're about 50% done filling in the parking lot area. Unfortunately, the rain's got us, um, but Utilities is making uh, preparations to start dewatering the area, and uh, that will probably take through December to get all that arranged, and then during the month of January, we're expecting to have that hole filled in well ahead of the county schedule to actually break ground there. Uh, Cooper Center Recreation Roof, we're going out for RFP for the roof on that building. Uh, we called a couple of roofers and obvious, or, Expectedly, they each told us that their method of repairing the roof was the best, um, but we're actually gonna go out for a formal RFP where they, they compete with um, the products that they're proposing. And uh, we did that at the uh, Cooper Street uh, Public Works Campus, Public Works Utility Campus, and it worked really good for the roofing because you know, they, they all have spec sheets that says their stuff's gonna last for years, but uh, this actually grills them to make sure that rather than just the low bidder, we're getting a product that we think is the best. Um, this is one I'm very glad to see come back on the list. 
Uh, we started a paver program throughout the downtown area several years ago, and then the last segment, Taylor Street on the west side between Marion Avenue and the Event Center had been left out of it for years. Um, we were finally pulling this back in, um, $120,000 to cover the cost. We're gonna remove the planters, probably the oak trees, plant the typical um, foxtails or whatever Mitchell tells us we're planting there, mm -hmm. or Joan, um, and we'll, we'll dress that area up with tree wells, uh, the, tip, the new pavers that we're using, and all of that sort of thing. Great, before we move on that. Um, this is really not, uh, has not officially been approved in our uh, capital projects plan for uh, immediate attention. We can do that. Capital improvements programs are flexible. Projects get moved around all the time. Uh, we know that this block is, has always been on our horizon. We just never got to it. In our sales tax program, we have categories that this project could conceivably fit in. We have intersection treatments. We have ADA improvements. We have, um, there, there's another category um, where we could, um, and that the people voted on as far as sales tax. So it's a question of do we want to try and see if we can use some sales tax dollars that may be available based on our projections to try and see if we can accomplish this project uh, as opposed to waiting around for the next sales tax program if we ever get one. I think we, if, if you haven't been down there to really look at this specifically, I heard from several of the business owners when I was walking around telling them about the tree lighting, it's bad. It's really, really bad. And those trees are tagged. Are they all coming out? They all have orange ribbons around the trees. I'm not sure what the ribbons are. We have not made any uh, markers or anything like that. We've not started the work on this whatsoever. Right, right. But the trees all have the orange ribbons. So I was... Uh, Joan LeBeau, Urban Design Manager. Um, we have been contacted by several other businesses down there because the trees are <coughs> uplifting the, the, the current bricks that are the pavers that are there. Um, the trees are starting to uh, lean towards the buildings. There's, so we're getting a lot of calls. I did speak with our Brewster regarding removing of them, <coughs> and um, we did indi he did indicate that this project was coming up. I did send him down there, so they may be tagged for that reason. I know they've been down there to look at them, and I'm, I'm assuming that's what they are there for, but I am not 100% sure. Okay, because the sidewalk itself is in really bad shape, and like you said, the pavers are very uneven, and it really is a mismatch with everything else that we, we have down there. Nancy? Uh, yeah, I've had uh, business owners comment to me for years mm -hmm. asking about it, and um, especially the fact that um, the event center has all kinds of uh, activity going on, people from out of town, and they're walking down the street to come to our restaurants, and, and this is probably the worst looking area for the people to, to see, so uh, I'm all in favor of doing this post haste. <laughs> I, I would add, I agree with that, um, but I also would like, like to add the block that is in front of the historic courthouse. We have all kinds of brick pavers that are cracked and broken and upended, and it's, it's really a mess, and it's, I consider it very dangerous. I was walking there a couple of weeks ago, and there are, there's some seriously out of place pavers that have come up perhaps from the roots of the trees. I'm not sure what's causing it, but there's a lot of broken bricks over there that I, I think it needs to be addressed for a safety reason. Well, I'm hearing three, four. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I'm not, uh, <laughs> I can restate everything you want, want but I'm, <laughs> you know. We will uh, see if we will, as a staff, we'll regroup and see if we can get this project somehow weaved into our program. Mm -hmm. so. Sounds good, because this planner, I don't think, has seen a plant in a very long time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we could turn it into a fire pit. It's a trash receptable, actually. <laughs> if you go look at that. Yeah, it's a garbage can. So let's All get right. it out of there. Thank you. We any have other questions some... on any public works projects? Nope. No. I'm fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ray Briggs, Fire Chief. Uh, this slide represents a uh, fund we have, and it's for replacement of, this is uh, basic equipment, everything from personal protective equipment for the firefighters, 
um, turnout gear, hose, as well as uh, there is a specific fund for advanced life support medical equipment. That's the life pack monitor and the auto pulse, some of the equipment that we carry. So this is a work in progress. And then our second slide is uh, fleet replacement. So this is purchase of one, uh, just class A pumper. This will replace engine two. Um, unfortunately, the process to do it, we're in spec right now and it takes them about nine months to build a fire truck. So we may not even see this by October. I'm hopeful we will, but um, that's the way it goes. We'll just keep doing what we're doing and, and get it built just as quickly as we can. And I think that's it for me. Good morning, Jason Jaskini, Interim Police Chief. Uh, this is our annual uh, police purchase for fleet. Uh, we're anticipating this year purchasing five new marked vehicles. Uh, this is gonna be a combination of sales tax and general fund uh, dollars. Um, if everything goes right with our process, which like the fire department's uh, truck process takes quite a long time, it's comprehensive. We're anticipating we'll deploy this next round of vehicles in the summer of 2018. What kind of cars are you buying? It's gonna be the same ones in the bottom right, the Ford Interceptor Utility. In the next slide, this is actually a citywide pro uh, project. Uh, it's been going on for quite a few years. It's Long originally, time. Yeah, originally started <laughs> as a little over a half a million dollar project. Uh, we have purchased our equipment. This is all part of the uh, countywide, what they call the P25 uh, radio system upgrade. We had to purchase uh, handheld radios and what they call mobiles or vehicle radios to support that project. Uh, we do have the equipment. The remaining uh, reason why the project still remains is we're waiting on the county. The county is uh, doing their uh, complete upgrade and build out of the system. The last update we got is going to be the summer of 2018 that they should be online, at which time we'll go ahead and put all of our mobile radios and vehicles, which is really what that 14000 remaining uh, dollars are. And then all the handhelds, uh, much of them are already deployed. We'll have to go through a reprogramming again of those radios and then deploy the remaining of those radios to our folks. Good morning, Tom Jackson, Utilities Department for the record. Um, uh, got about three slides for you this morning. First of all, our groundwater RO uh, treatment plant um, is underway. Behind the scenes, I can report that our groundwater permit has been deemed complete and we're just waiting on the district to issue our groundwater permit for our well field, our well field testing. The first phase of it was successful and complete. Uh, we thought we would have that permit in hand by Thanksgiving, but they're backlogged a little bit, so it'll probably be closer to the first of the year. Uh, we have, we anticipate with procurement to bid the project out through the CMAR, Wharton Smith, uh, the first part of the year. And then we'll come back to you obviously with those contracts and those numbers going forward. Oops. Secondly, our water treatment plant raw water pumping station. The original wall, raw water pumping station was built in 1965. It was upgraded in the late 1980s and it had gotten to a point where we not only could not buy parts for the controllers, we couldn't fabricate parts anymore for the controllers. So we needed to go in at this point in time and change out the pumps and the controllers and the building and the, and the generator power. Uh, that's been a great uh, project. We're on schedule, we're on budget. We anticipate being 100% complete with that by uh, March of 2018. And finally, uh, a great project near and dear to our hearts because it gives us additional uh, wastewater capacity in south in our system, the Jones Loop Force Main. The construction, or I'm sorry, the uh, uh, design is 100% complete. We're in the process of obtaining our permits. We have three permits to get. We have two from DEP, which will be pretty straightforward and pretty easy. The, the more problematic one is the FDOT permit to cross under the interstate. Johnson Engineering, our consultant, uh, one of the reasons we picked them is that's, their, that's in their wheelhouse. They specialize in FDOT uh, permits. Uh, that process is underway. We hope to have all our permits in hand and be ready to go out to bid for construction in March. We anticipate once we have a contractor on board, it'll take about a year to complete the project. So we're looking at a, a completion of March uh, 2019 for that. And I believe that's it for me. Any questions? Yes. Yes, sir. 
you knew you weren't going to get away from yes. that. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So I have uh, uh, two items that I just would like you to address. One, because we've, we've discussed these already, but uh, uh, when we go out for the next round of bids, will we be looking at bidding some of the equipment? Because there is a market upward pressure yes. over the cost yes. of that. Wharton and now Smith. We, even if we had to, do, to uh, uh, warehouse it for a while, mm -hmm. there's a potential for great, great... Uh, the Savings finance department, address. especially Marion, has been just a champion of, of, of owner purchase beforehand to save on, uh, first of all, sales tax, but secondly, to, to clip off any uh, price increases. Wharton Smith will price out the RO membranes as well as all the, the pumps and hardware for that with this when they go out to bid in January. So, Thank yes. You. I just wanted that. everybody else to be aware. Yes. Of, of that discussion. Also, uh, regarding when we get ready to actually start building the building, mm -hmm. uh, you and we had some discussion. There's a shortage of uh, hurricane shelters in Charlotte County, uh, and if if this would be a bu building that might be amenable to hardened to be uh, available space uh, in that type of situation. Yeah, the fire chief and I have discussed this on a couple of occasions, and. Uh, he's going to, yeah, I just want to make sure he, I don't want to speak out of turn and make sure he hears what I'm saying. Uh, he's on board with the concept. We are too. Uh, I need his expertise. We're going to look at, I'm asked uh, him to look with me at the design and at the plans. And, uh, certainly we will consider that this building will be built to Miami Dade hurricane standards, 140 mile an hour standards. So obviously we expect it to act as a shelter. So sure. we'll see what capacities we, we can find out there. Certainly. Yeah. And the point of our discussion was, is if we think about it now, it's right. Less make some expensive minor changes than, uh, to make some minor changes to make sure that we could accommodate uh, uh, families, et cetera, under that. Condition. Absolutely. It's a great idea. Great. Thank great you very idea. much. Very good idea. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Brad Schutte, uh, city IT manager. Um, and the projects that we have to um, present for the, this fiscal year, the first is uh, annex Im uh, improvements to the city hall and city hall annex buildings, um, accessibility and security issues that we need to address. Um, this project is, is uh, well underway and um, you can see the estimates there, about 49,000 for renovations, um, $85,000 for the security. The ADA requirements are still under review. Uh, upgrades to the city council chambers. We've completed phase one, which was mostly audio upgrades and the projector, the screen, those types of things have been completed. Uh, phase two will be mostly video and we'll deal with the cameras and, and video system, allowing us to broadcast um, live uh, as well as um, do a, um, a more efficient job of recording um, and for archiving. Uh, this project is also uh, being, this is being funded both out of the sales tax and out of our IT internal service fund. Um, about $30,000 is the estimate so far. Our other projects, um, whoops, what did they do? Uh -oh. Excuse me. Disappeared on me. I think the 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 version that I looked at had our individual slides on it. This one it looks like they summarized it at the very end. So I'll jump through here to get to that last slide again. Um, <clears throat> we're uh, most of the IT projects for, for this fiscal year are, are smaller projects. We've completed our, uh, over the last couple of years, our large projects of our storage, our telephone system, those types of things. Um, moving forward in this year, we are going to be purchasing another uh, host server for our virtual machine system. Um, we're on a replacement cycle with those, so the one of ours is aged out, and this will be bought to, to replace and bring that one up to date. We're in year four of our annual replacement of computers. Um, the, the purchase, the estimate for this year, or the, the budget for this year is $85,000, um, and that'll cover about 25% of the total computer inventory of the city. Um, it's been a very, very uh, positive uh, thing to keep us now on this replacement cycle. It ensures us that all of our equipment stays up to date and, and with the rapid movement of, of technology, cap techno technology capabilities, um, keeping these computers up to date is really important. 
Um, the firewall appliance for public safety, we run two separate networks. A couple of years back, we purchased a, a, a brand new firewall that's been acting as our firewall for the entire, um, our entire city network. Um, since our public safety is really a separate network, it's needed to have its own, so this will be purchasing the, the firewall. It'll also provide us with redundancy that in case a, there's any type of a problem with our, our main firewall, that firewall will be able to act as a, as a backup. So it's just another piece of infrastructure that um, ensures the integrity of our networks. Um, the unstructured data management is an appliance um, called a Veron Veronis. That is going to allow us to do a better job of managing all of our file server data. Um, it reviews the data for uh, PII, um, personally, uh, personal information. Um, it, it can identify credit card numbers, social security numbers, anything that shouldn't be there in, pub in our, our file server data, as well as redundant data, old data that hasn't been accessed in a long amount of time. It's going to allow us to do a much better job of keeping our storage um, our storage use more efficient, which will reduce our need to go out and buy more storage um, as we move forward. Um, the last two, the wireless access points for our utilities locations, we've put wireless into all of our other city facilities, the water plant, wastewater plant were the last two places that we haven't put wireless into yet, so we'll be accomplishing that. And um, our net motion connectivity is a, is a process that will allow um, our, we're moving out beyond just our law enforcement into our other field um, devices that will maintain their connectivity, allow them to come back to the city network without having to go through uh, a, a, a separate um, virtual private network or VPN, which is a very slow and clunky connection. This will give them accessibility almost as speed that they're, that they're acquaint, accustomed to, excuse me, uh, at their desk. So it'll allow us to keep that, that connectivity going out in the field. And those are the IT projects. Any questions? Questions for Brad? Yep. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, again, another conversation that Brad and I have had, and I'll be asking uh, the City Council to consider at our next meeting. Uh, we'll be uh, retiring, as I understand, 21 laptops and tablets uh, in this process. Yes, sir. And uh, I will be asking the uh, my council members at the next meeting to uh, donate the retired equipment to the um, Homeless Student and GAP Fund of Charlotte County. Uh, this is a, a fund that uh, specifically targets the homeless students in Charlotte County uh, to try to provide them uh, as best as they can with uh, uh, communication technology that otherwise tends to get lost in the overall things that, so that these kids continue on their education. Uh, and so um, we'll be making a formal presentation at our next meeting, and I hope uh, that I'll be able to solicit your support in that endeavor. Uh, Brad and Mr. Drury have been a great help in uh, uh, trying to put together the presentation we'll make to you next week. So thank you. All right. Anything else? Thank you very much. Jaha. I just want to have Brad help me oh. with something here. Oh, you need <laughs> yeah. technical help? Okay, that's good timing because we are going to take a break. <laughs> Don't go far away. It's, we are going to take crazy. a 10 minute break. Come back at 1042. Green is doing yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's that's dancing. That's kind of my day. Right what happened? Stuck on a Good form, Jaha. Oh. There we go. Uh, let's see. Still down? Okay, 1042. We're making a comeback here. And we're moving into unfinished business. Harbor Walk Area 2, final construction plan development. Uh, good, uh, good morning. For the record, again, Mitchell Austin, Urban Design. Uh, this presentation is regarding the Harbor Walk at Gilcrest Park. Um, we're moving into the, the point in time where we need to get final construction plans together, and we're just verifying that we are on track. Um, just for a little bit of history, um, Harbor Walk at Gilcrest Park was broken up into areas um, many years ago. It's obviously a very large project. Um, here recently, uh, since 2016, we've completed the seawall. Under uh, the final stages of construction, thank goodness, is uh, area one, which is substantially complete. The area we'll be talking about today is area two, and that's the section of the park that stretches from Gill Street to Berry Street, which is where Bayfront Center is. 
And then Area 3, um, which it does have some federally f federal funds associated with it in 2020-2021, um, stretches from Barrie to the Tidal Canal um, and the entrance to Fisherman, or the, the back door to Fisherman's Village. <clears throat> So again, area two is uh, from Gill to Berry Street. This portion of the park does contain uh, the tennis and pickleball courts as they exist today, the Ponce de Leon statue, uh, the Gilchrist Park playground, um, and the basketball courts and Bayfront Center. <clears throat> so the main improvements that are designed in the in the current plans for Gilcrest Park uh, are the streetscape improvements along Red Esplanade, which is the on-street parking, the intersection treatments, uh, and then within the body of the park, redoing the walkways that connect the street to the future Harbor Walk, uh, and then the Harbor Walk itself. <coughs> Additionally, at the, the Gilcrest uh, Park Playground end of the, uh, of the proposed improvements, uh, there's a, a restructuring of the existing parking areas uh, to, to increase the parking capacity at the playground. <clears throat> so we know that we need to update the construction plans for Area 2. We have to updates to reflect portions of the park that have already been completed within the project area uh, like Gilcrest Landing, the, the playground facility, there have been, or there will be pieces of the puzzle that will be complete by the time we go to construction for area two. Uh, we need to ensure that those places are fully accounted for in the plans. <coughs> Additionally, we need to make modifications to ensure that uh, the constructability of the park is, is uh, adequate, uh, that ADA accessibility is, uh, is fully compliant with current standards and our ADA transition plan, and that we maximize parking uh, to facilitate as many park users as possible. <clears throat> so generally within the breaking this down a little bit, uh, for the Harbor Walk itself, um, the current portion of the Harbor Walk that was constructed in Area 1, there's a five-foot offset from the seawall. Uh, that was not originally anticipated. That was actually a change that was, uh, that was required by the Florida Department of Transportation uh, with their funding associated with that portion of the park. So we need to carry that uh, across into the new area. Um, we do need to redesign the area around the fishing pier. There were some ADA improvements that were done so, uh, a couple of years ago uh, in association with the, uh, the seawall improvements. Um, so that area needs uh, to, to be re-looked at to make sure that we're meeting the grades and, and accommodating the facilities that, as they're currently constructed. <coughs> And also, uh, there needs to be a, a simplification of the design between the, the Bayfront Center across the Berry Street um, uh, interchange. One of the comments that uh, FDOT had that one of their concerns when they looked at a set of plans of, of Harbor Walk was the, the number of 90 degree bins uh, in this area. Um, mm -hmm. so, so we just need to look at that and make sure we know what we're doing and, and make sure that we're um, that we're making the path easy to follow and still accommodating all the future improvements that are slated for that area. <clears throat> uh, other things that uh, we, we may need to look at is the, uh, the intersection treatments. Uh, in the current project in area one, we had some underground conflicts uh, that caused us some serious problems, and we need to figure out a way to avoid those in the, f in the future phase as much as possible. And we also need to be careful on, on those that, that were within ADA compliance, slopes, cross slopes, uh, pavement crossing conditions, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> Parking, in the area of parking, the current plans have the parking ending essentially at uh, Dolly Street. Um, we could, uh, with 
maximizing the parking at, at Bayfront Center and the playground, carry um, that uh, on-street parking from Dolly all the way to Barry and possibly reconfigure the parking lot around the Bayfront Center as it exists today uh, to increase the number of available parking spaces, which would benefit not only the playground and the use of the park, but also the Bayfront Center and the boat club as it exists today. In terms of recreational amenities, uh, at, a, at a previous council discussion, uh, there was a, a consensus that we should rehabilitate the existing basketball courts. Um, in terms of landscape design, we need to verify that, that or we need to look at it to see what we can do about providing more shade. Uh, providing more um, sort of usable open space given the sort of stormwater management issues that we have to deal with um, and uh, planning for future recreational amenities if any are, are desired or required um, and also providing uh, picnic areas, informal picnic areas within the green space of the park and ensuring that we're ADA compliant because when we provide those informal picnic facilities we have to provide a certain percentage that are accessible. Uh, the last thing that I have on my list that we need to look at is a vendor cart location. Uh, currently, the city has two active vendor cart locations. One is designated in Gilcrest Park and one is designated at Ponce Park. And in the current plans, there is no s designated location with water power, uh, a parking spot suitable for that uh, vendor. Uh, in the current plan, so we need to find a place to put them if City Council desires to continue that long-standing tradition of having a vendor in Gilcrest Park. Yep. And that's really all I have. So, um, I know we've heard a lot of comments about Phase 1, and we need to make some decisions before we uh, try to move on Phase 2. Um, some some key decisions some of these decisions have been made all the way back 2008 2009 by a lot of groups city councils have been consistent throughout the years on staying the course with those decisions that were made all the way back then the first decision is do we continue the 20-foot harbor walk to connect to the bayfront at one time, back in 2008, the thought process by some groups um, was we should extend it to 30 feet. Well, that was pushed back to 20 feet after much discussion. And why is it 20 feet? Because the Harbor Walk is so popular that we have all different recreational activities going on, <clears throat> and all we heard over the years was they were all bumping into each other, there were conflicts, there were arguments, and probably won't hear those very much anymore with what we have put in place. So, number one decision, do we stay the course and complete the Harbor Walk connection from the gazebo to where we concluded at the Bayfront with that same design? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I mean, it was very clear that, that those who were walking and those who were biking were conflicting with each other. And so it's one of those things that was I mean, that's just an issue that we can ameliorate with doing it, continuing this design. An additional consideration, um, I was a part of the community group that proposed the 30-foot, and um, one of the considerations was um, in having a wider Harbor Walk is to be able to also hold host events along the Harbor Walk so that there could be uh, vendor tents on the grass and people could be wandering along the Harbor Walk and then, um, uh, you know, looking at it, whether it's an art fair or whatever it is. So um, it, it's more conducive to having events there and not being congested at the same time. So, um, so are we? I'm okay. Yes. Yeah. The, second, so the second thing we need to decide is do we continue the on street? diagonal parking along Retta, especially on phase two, we've heard a lot of complaints from the <coughs> neighborhood folks regarding the parking on the grass by the pickleball courts and the tennis courts 
and all the problems that's created, mm -hmm. do we continue to, to the, uh, take the diagonal parking and basically take it all the way to Berry, which means no parking on the grass in that area anymore? I think we need to take it as far as we possibly can, even in front of the Bayfront Center if possible. Yeah. I mean, it's not just the neighbors, it's any user of Retta Esplanade, it's a problem yeah. right now. So at least this gives some order to <coughs> how you park and how you go about whatever you're doing mm -hmm. in that area. It's consistent. I would agree with that, take it as far as we can. In addition, um, I, I really think that we should um, not get rid of the parking that is in between the tennis court and the pickleball courts that's off street parking as well as the other parking lot that is um, um, between Gill, Gill. and, Gill. I, you know, I really feel if we are going to encourage, um, try to put as much parking in the park as possible, those two parking lots can help um, uh, keep people from parking in the neighborhoods. Um, and I just think you know, we've, we've put a nice big parking lot down by the children's playground, but we've got a whole lot of activity on the other end of the park. And, and really, we don't have a parking. We have that one, the small parking lot down by the hotel, but that's it. And so um, I'd like to see us redesign the plans so, to accommodate some off-street parking. To keep that, keep, keep those what lots. we have. Yeah, I mean, redesign those so that they're in keeping with the same style, um, at least to provide some additional uh, parking spaces. Um, I mean, that would solve the vendor cart problem too, right? Because that's where the vendor cart is now, <coughs> correct, on that parking lot? Uh, the vendor cart location uh, was on the <coughs> portion of the, uh, the the Gill Street parking lot that was reconfigured. So the, actually their, their original location is gone, but yes, it was in that area of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I would agree with Nancy. Um, I received a letter from a citizen yesterday who was asking, um, just for clarification, are the pickleball courts going to remain there? Mm -hmm. Okay, because the rumor out on the street is that they're going to be taken out when Pickleplex is built, and they were very upset about that. Um, but because of the pickleball courts still being very popular, and for those who may not wish to go all the way out Airport Road, mm -hmm. they wanted to make sure the pickleball courts were still there, and there was a big concern about the redesign of the park taking out the off-street parking because on any given day, there's as many as 50 or 60 cars parked there's on the There's too many, grass. it's right. too many. But we need to at least keep what we have, if not make it a little larger to accommodate all yeah. the cars that will be using those facilities because right. we don't have enough parking in, in the park at right. this point. I, yeah, I, I think it's to encourage people to park there as opposed to, um, across the street on the right of way in front of the homes mm -hmm. and things like that. So I think if we're providing more parking, it's, I think it's a good thing. Gary. Okay. Um, <coughs> Austin, you, uh, you had uh, mentioned that uh, re by uh, Bayfront and the boat club, there was a possibility of redesigning or re uh, reconfiguring some of the parking there that might be also <coughs> able to give, give us, you know, it would be curious to see what kind of uh, parking increase we might be able to see there in this park, which is just going to put a little bit more pressure. Maybe the guitar army is going to have 1,200 people instead of 1,000 people sometimes. And this, these are good things. We want people to come in to enjoy and get to see, to see our, uh, our community and, and uh, appreciate our businesses and so forth. Uh, I have a question just on a, and this is premature, I understand, but it seemed to me that uh, in, in some of our designs, we had a conflict of interest between ADA and drainage of the Harper Walk itself that the, because of the angle of the concrete, was, am I correct in that memory? Uh, on portions of the Harbor Walk that had been built previously and other areas and areas that had pavers um, primarily, okay. we, we had some ADA issues, but not in this portion. So in, in going forward with this area, you don't see any conflicts of being able to design to be able to meet both criteria with that fine. Okay, I just no, want to be clear. because this is poured concrete, the, too. You know, yeah. he's talking, it there's mean, settlement, yeah. you know, certain areas, the okay. grade. And, and the separation, the five-foot separation from the seawall also helps, too, because the areas that were most p a problem that had been built recently were mm -hmm. immediately abutting a seawall, so you 
you know, we all have uh, sinkholes in our backyards or on the seawall. That's that's happening under those seawalls as well. I don't. I just call the city and they fix them and they go away. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they do. I, I've called them many times and they do go away for a little while and they come right back. No, I just I just wanted to be clear clear in my mind on that. And uh, uh, parking is always going to be an issue, uh, but I don't think we want parking on the grass, but we do want to maximize Maximize. I think we need maximal, maximized parking, even if that means redoing the Bayfront parking well, lot, you at see, least looking at it. You see what our plan is here mm -hmm. for the playground and the basketball. Can you put the slide on there for the between the tennis courts, pickleball? Yes. I mean, do we really need that sidewalk in front of Bayfront if we have the harbor walk behind? Um, well, certainly if we put the on-street parking, we need to provide a walkway okay. there. So, so that it would go it more would, in it front. Would be, yeah, it would, it would be consistent with what you see. Right there. Mm -hmm. Right there. From Chastine to Dolly. Mm -hmm. It would just go from Dolly to Barry. Yeah, so, so this would be mirrored across here, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which would eliminate this <clears throat> sort of circular loop drive, but you could easily connect to the Barry Street extension in a logical way and actually provide a a double loaded parking aisle across the front of the existing Bayfront Center, okay. which would provide a substantial amount of parking mm -hmm. that compared to the current plans. You know, we have to be careful. Yeah. That's a historic area with the parakeets. Keep the tree. <laughs> <laughs> that, that will reduce parking efficiency, but certainly we can, we can explore its location. There's a historic significance to that area there. Yeah, the parakeets the are parakeets. Keep the tree. Yeah. Don't mess with the parakeets. No. <laughs> That's true. I also think in the back of our mind, what? we also have to consider. They're not around they're anymore? They're not around. They're saying they're not around. What happened to them? The, bat, the bats chased them away. Well, they'll be back. Uh, we also have to keep in consideration that there is... I called is, them up. They'll be back. There is discussion and on the wish list that eventually uh, the Bayfront and the Boat Club will be redone. Right. So what we do, you know, we, you know, we may have to tear some of it back up. We may not. We'll, we'll know. But I'm just saying as we kind of kind of keep that in the back of our mind also. Certainly with, with the... Uh, planning of this in terms of if we're, we're actually going to maximize parking across the front of Bayfront and, and do some other things in that Berry Street area. Um, we'll, staff will work closely with the engineer to ensure that we've sort of cordoned off an area that would be appropriate for the placement of a replacement Bayfront boat club building. Yeah. Um, so there's still a footprint left. Correct. <laughs> that would be that, great. That would. Mm -hmm. What other decisions did we need? Go back to... Uh, Tennis court, uh, pickleball area? Yes. Okay. So um, try and preserve some of the off-street parking area that's currently there. Mm -hmm. yes. Currently, the off-street parking is right here yeah. uh, with a driveway that empties uh, onto Gilchrist Street. Mm -hmm. The other parking area is actually under this location here. Yes. So that, that would require substantial redesign but certainly something that could that could be accomplished in this process and try and preserve the landscaping as much as we can mm -hmm. okay we uh, we okay we got good direction now I believe we do Does the